our lunch speaker. Thank you. If I keep talking, people will get quiet. Isn't that the rule? Don't make me sing. Thank you all very much for returning. Chris Bean is going to introduce our lunch speaker. Give him a round of applause, please. Good afternoon. If anybody didn't get enough to eat, please, please uh, help yourself for, for more or, or take some home. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have Richard Opper as our keynote speaker this afternoon. Um, there's a lot going on in, in his agency and, all, and their arms all across the state. Uh, and for him to take time out to, to sit with us today and talk with us, I think, is uh, a testament to what we've done here in Missoula and uh, the communications that we continue to strive for uh, with our state agencies. Richard uh, spent a long, long time, and I've, I've worked with him, with him before, uh, in the private sector doing uh, work uh, from the private side on environmental projects across our state and studies. Um, he is currently the director of uh, the Montana Department of Environmental Quality, and he wanted to make sure that he is the author of, as of yet, a little-known novel, uh, and would like to make sure that, uh, if, if at all possible, you can make it more well-known. Uh, Richard Opper. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for having me here. Um, you know, I'm a little, um, I'm a little new at this, uh, you know, business of giving speeches here, so I, I just wanted to get some tips on how to do it, so I watched the Republican convention last night, so I thought I'd start off by saying that um, I am a hockey mom. <laughs> it, uh, it worked for her, too, you know? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, where the hell's the teleprompter here? <laughs> I'm lost. No, it's, uh, anyway, I'm really glad to be here. Um, thanks for having me again. And, you know, there are a couple of things I really love, one of which is Missoula. I used to live here, and this is a great community. And I also love the Brownfields Redevelopment Program. I mean, I've got some personal experience with it that uh, my staff certainly knows, and folks from Lewistown know. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But, uh, I really love that program, and I love what it represents. I love the potential that it holds for communities, and so I just think it's great that there are so many people um, who came today to learn more about this and how it can help your respective communities. So, um, so it's great. So, some of you have probably heard me talk before. Um, some of you um, lucky ones probably haven't yet, um, and I I can be a little irreverent at times. Uh, you know, I tend to overuse humor. I'm not as funny as I think I am, but I do like to use jokes a lot. I'm I'm no Mayor Ingen, you know, but I, you know, I, I can tell a, tell a good line occasionally. But I'm going to take a different tact here. I'm going to start off by being really depressing. Um, I haven't tried that before. I just want to see how it works. So I, I want some feedback afterwards. Okay, tell me how you like this. So I um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of the country here and some of the issues that we're facing. So, you know, that's, that's a good depressing start, I think. You know, th these are interesting times, and whether you're for it or against it, the war, actually the two wars that we're in, have drained an enormous amount of wealth from our country. And I think we all know that. I think what we don't know is the implication this is going to have for our children. But um, we aren't as wealthy a nation as we used to be, uh, in large part because of what we're spending on the war. Um, that's, like I said, that's got all kinds of ramifications for the country right now, and um, we've seen our energy prices spike. Gasoline has gone up almost fourfold the last five years. I think everybody's aware of that if you drive. If you don't, more power to you. Um, a lot of that increase has come in the last, couple, last year or so, uh, that increase in gas prices. Food prices are going up. Um, skyrocketing also. Um, yeah, there's just a, a lot of changes that are taking place right now, and that's got us all concerned. Our dollar's worth a lot less than it used to be, and it takes a lot more of them now to fill up our cars and to heat our homes, too. And, you know, the, now we've got another thing that we can feel guilty about, and I grew up with Jewish parents, so I'm real susceptible to guilt. I mean, I don't have that original sin thing that the Catholics have, but I do, you know, I'm real susceptible to this. But now we've got carbon guilt to worry about, too. We've got to worry about our carbon footprint. And we've got reason to worry about our carbon footprint because if you've seen the graphs, um, 
over the past half million years, um, atmospheric CO2 concentrations and atmospheric temperatures, the two graphs fit together like a key in a lock. I mean, it's an amazing correlation between those two graphs. And considering the fact that in, in my lifetime alone, I'm not single-handedly responsible for this, but in my lifetime alone, we've gone from a fairly high concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere to 30% higher than any time in the last half million years. We've got some reason to be concerned about how much carbon we emit here. Um, so we all should feel guilty um, about our carbon footprint and do what we can to reduce that uh, on a personal level um, as well as working for policies that will help uh, reduce that. So you should feel guilty about it even if you're not Jewish or Catholic. I, I really encourage you to join the club here when it comes to carbon. So, um, you know, the high gas prices that we're facing, uh, you know, they cause a lot of harm to a lot of American families, granted. Um, but some good things are coming out of that, of course. One of them is there are fewer Humvees on the road. You know, that can't be a bad thing for all of us. You know, that's, that's a real relief to those of us who drive smaller things uh, on the road, like motor scooters. <laughs> that's another story. I'm not going to go into my motor scooter experiences. Ask my staff about it sometime. Um, so uh, it's also, I think the high gas prices are finally going to spur American car companies into taking uh, seriously this notion of producing fuel efficient cars. Um, I hope it's not too late for American car companies. I'd like to see them turn it around, but they've been way behind much of the rest of the world in terms of uh, the innovation they've shown in, in producing efficient vehicles. So I think that's going to turn around um, right now. We're already seeing some examples of that, and that's obviously a very good thing. Even Congress has gotten into the act here. I mean, they, we now have a, a, a tighter fuel standard. We, we've got a fuel standard, fuel efficiency standard that Congress recently passed. It's not a real strong one. Uh, just to give you an idea, what, what the standard is, it says that in 12 years, American car companies must make cars that get about 15 miles a gallon less than cars were getting 25 years ago. Okay, they have to get like 35 miles a gallon. We were getting 50 miles a gallon in the 80s. I don't know why we can't do that now, but uh, it's a start, you know, a, a baby step, but it's a start. So, um, you know, we've seen problems too with our um, building practices too, the way we build our homes and our businesses. Um, average home now is more than twice as uh, uh, big as it was when, when I was a kid. Um, we've all seen that. Um, bigger homes require more lumber, they require more concrete, building materials in general. They require more energy to heat and power them. And um, our subdivisions now are, seem to be given getting built farther and farther away from our city centers, which of course fosters an even greater dependence on automobiles, which is a bad thing. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of issues with the way we build our homes, but what we're seeing now is the high heating prices now, high electricity and natural gas prices, that's starting to cause some changes too. You know, those big, poorly insulated homes located far away from where people shop and work, um, they're not doing all that well on the market right now. Um, the ones that are close to transportation centers, the ones where you can live and walk to work and, and school, those are doing, those are holding up much better in, the, in terms of their price. So I think the market's starting to shift on, on homes too, which is also a really good thing. And the other thing we're seeing now is that former blighted areas in hearts of the city that people shied away from because of contamination, uh, Developers now are starting to take a second look at these places, thinking this is a good place to work, a good place to live. It's worth the investment of cleaning this place up so people can live and work in the heart of the city. And that's where this wonderful Brown Fields program comes into play. And um, I think it's, uh, it's high time. Now, I think I mentioned before, I've, I've had some experience with Brown Fields uh, redevelopment projects. This was long before I had any clue that I would end up working for state government, particularly as director of uh, the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, I don't know how the hell that happened. Um, but um, I was living in Lewistown at the time, and you'll hear more about this project from Dwayne Ferdinand, I believe, this afternoon, right? You're going to be talking about it? Good. But um, it was my son, actually, when he was 10 years old, he discovered um, some PCB um, toxicity, waste dump 
area in Big Spring Creek in Lewistown, Montana. And uh, I will say, I don't want to brag too much, but it, that's a hell of a science project for a fifth grader. Um, but it, he actually did pinpoint some contamination. And so he wrote these uh, letters uh, to uh, a couple of agencies, one of which was EPA and one of which was DEQ, an agency I had no familiarity with at the time, and told them about his findings, and they were immediately responsive. And I'd have to say, our staff, Denise, your crew, you and your crew were so great about responding to this 10-year-old who could barely write his name at the time. So they came out, they confirmed the results, and um, they did all kinds of work on the, on the area. And um, a lot of really good things happened, but a lot of that work was dependent upon Brownfield's redevelopment funding that went into cleaning this place up. And now this site that uh, had been contaminated has been cleaned up. Um, the creek, which had been straightened uh, 100 years or so ago, has been redesigned and re-engineered, so it's got meander bins in it now. It is a beautiful park now that the city owns that is getting so much use because there's a world-class trail system now throughout Lewistown. It's one of the best trail systems in the state. In fact, it just got a statewide award for having the best trail system. And people are using this. People are coming from all over the state to visit this site, uh, all over the region. People are moving to town. And I dare say that this cleanup project, thanks to the Brownfields Redevelopment Project funding that we got, has probably done more for Lewistown's economy than any other economic development scheme that's been hatched to that community in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, I, I couldn't be happier about the results I've seen. So you can see why I'm somewhat enthusiastic about this program, because I, I do have a personal history with it. But one of the things I've been learning since I became director, I've been learning lots of things. Um, one is that people don't like regulators. Um, <laughs> God, I should have seen that coming, huh? One of the things I've been learning about uh, this program is that it actually can and it really should do even more than it did for Lewistown. And the way it can do more is to combine elements of green building principles and sustainable communities to the whole revitalization aspects that, that, that allows communities to do. And by blending those two concepts, really good things can come from this program, even better than we've seen already on the ground in this state in my backyard. So um, revitalization projects in general, they've got four phases. They've got uh, uh, the uh, deconstruction phase. They've got the cleanup or remediation phase. They've got uh, reconstruction. And then finally, they have reuse of the site. So you can build green principles into all four of these phases. And, and I think it's, uh, there are lots of opportunities here. And again, we heard from EPA a little bit this morning that EPA is, uh, this program is beginning to uh, give competitive advantage to people who incorporate some of these green principles. When you are in the deconstruction phase, tearing down old properties that were on the site, um, lots of things you can do. You can um, make sure that your um, equipment is fueled by um, clean, renewable energy, if, if possible. We've got some sites now, a mining site, that uh, they've converted all the machinery to biodiesel right now. And it's been actually great for the workers there. It's much better for air quality because a lot of the mining is underground. So there's a lot that can be done by uh, how you power your equipment. So um, that's one thing you can do um, as you demolish structures. You can use uh, cleaner fuels for this. You can. Uh, try to save and uh, reuse as much of the materials that you demolish, hopefully on site, as you can. Um, that's a good thing. When you um, are in your cleanup phase, the remediation phase, there are a lot of things you can do there, too. Um, one of the things we at DEQ try to do is we try to encourage the use of clean, renewable um, cleanup remediation technologies that use less energy where possible. As long as you can get to the desired outcome, it's much better to choose a um, technology that uses less energy. Uh, I don't have a good brownfields example of that, but I had to make a um, decision recently on a reclamation plan for um, a gold mine in the state. And uh, I ended up choosing a plan. It had There were some problems with the plan we chose and some criticism of it. It was controversial. But the plan I chose not only provided better water quality, um, but it actually would have will use 
and I estimated something like 220 Olympic size swimming pools full of diesel. Um, it would use that much less diesel fuel for the reclamation plan. So you get better water quality, you get much less use of fuel. I think it was a good choice. Now we got criticized from the environmental community of all things for the choice, but um, such is the nature of my job. It's, I've got a, a rule here, some of you heard me say this, it's, uh, I think it's the 63% rule. It doesn't seem to matter what decision I make, it's still gonna piss off about 63% of the people. Um, it's not hard and fast, I have hit the high 70s before. <laughs> So, so I talked about um, the deconstruction phase, I talked about the remediation phase. Uh, during reconstruction, we really like to encourage, if there are new buildings built, we really like to encourage the use of recycled materials where possible. Um, we like to see greenscapes being put in in these areas that use less water, that use gray water where possible for um, uh, supporting the landscape. And um, so there are a lot of things you can do during the reconstruction phase. And of course, during reuse, we have a whole section here in, at, at DEQ that helps people um, figure out how to um, produce less waste in where they live and where they work. And uh, that's what we'd like to see in these new developments, that they um, produce less waste, that they use fewer chemicals for their cleaning supplies, that kind of thing. So there are lots of green opportunities all throughout these re uh, development projects, revitalization projects that the Brownfields redevelopment project uh, funding can help with. Um, you know, there's some great examples uh, around the region here of Brownfield redevelopment projects that have incorporated green technologies, one of which I think the best example is the new EPA headquarters in Region 8. Has anybody been there? Raise your hand if you've been there. Yeah, my staff has. So I went in the background. It's a marvelous building, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's made from recycled materials. They saved as much of the old shell as they could. It uses um, less than 50% of the energy that a conventionally built building would be used. They, they're, they're experimenting with green roofs where they're growing plants on top to moderate the temperatures. Wonderful use of natural lighting, and it, it's really a marvelous case uh, example. And it was built on a contaminated site that was cleaned up. So it really is a great example. We've got some really good examples locally too of uh, green building sites. They're not necessarily brownfield sites, but I was just visiting one of them today. It was uh, the Missoula Federal Credit Union that they're building now, the new, new site. Anybody been out there? Raise your hands. A few of you have seen it. Um, yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's supposed to open um, no later than January of next year. So they're, they're making good progress and um, so it's constructed of, uh, they're using a lot of recycled timbers. Um, they, uh, they're gonna use gray water for landscaping, they're gonna, uh, which is, I think, marvelous. Um, the building's gonna produce almost 10% of the energy it uses from solar panels that they're gonna install. And even on top of that, the building's gonna use about half the energy that a similarly sized building that was constructed normally uh, with conventional construction would use. and Powering this building, lighting this building, uh, heating it, cooling it, is going to result in the emission of 200,000 pounds per year less CO2 emissions than an, uh, a conventional building that size would do. That's how much CO2 you're saving, it's 200,000 pounds a year. And um, another thing that's really intriguing about that building, the Missoula Federal Credit Union, is they're using no Portland cement. Um, and Portland cement is, um, a great building material that is really hard on the earth to produce. Um, almost, I've seen statistics that almost 10% of the energy that's used throughout the world is used to manufacture cement. That's how much energy it uses. And I've, I've visited uh, one of our cement factories that we have in uh, Montana, we only have two of them, and uh, it takes a lot of energy to produce this Portland cement. You have a coal-fired furnace at one end of a 400-foot-long um, rotating drum. And uh, they put in a slurry that's a mixture of stuff in one end, and it takes four hours of this stuff to work, um, work its way through. And it uses tons of coal, and the chemical process just drives off tons, literally, of CO2. So it is really a very dirty material to have to work with. What they're doing here, what they used instead of Portland cement, 
to build the new Missoula Federal Credit Union is a product called Flash and Glass. I had to say that slowly because I cannot say that quickly. Um, it'll come out like a dirty word. I don't know what, what word, but I just don't trust myself. Um, so this material is made of fly ash, which is the product that you get after you burn coal in, in power plants, and recycled glass material. And I've got a couple of examples here. Um, can, we can pass this around. This material is it's tougher than concrete. It's more durable. Um, it's uh, a really eco-friendly product, too, because all you have to do is mix this material together, the fly ash, the recycled glass, and water. And then it sets up like concrete and lasts as long and is as durable and even harder than concrete. No cooking, no muss, no fuss. I mean, it really is a marvelous product. So they're using 1,000 tons of this material to build the new Federal Credit Union. So um, I just think it's a great example of uh, green building practices, and uh, I encourage everybody to go see it. Um, I think all you local folks should open up a checking account there, you know, <laughs> just to encourage them, you know. We want to encourage people to do the right thing. So um, this product holds a lot of potential for Montana because um, one plant alone, uh, I assume it's coal strip, produces about 22,000 pounds of fly ash a year and the state produces about 64,000 uh, tons, tons with the unit of mint, not pounds. We produce about 64,000 tons a year of uh, uh, gla recycled glass in the state. So we can replace a lot of our use of Portland cement by uh, an eco-friendly product like this. So, you know, this building project really could inspire a lot of change and a lot of change on some of the redevelopment projects we're seeing downtown. And, Again, this idea of melding brownfields redevelopment work with green building principles, I think, works so well for this state and this country and the world right now. And, you know, just imagine if you, for, for just a minute, just imagine a development in the heart of a city, combination uh, um, business and uh, residential development um, that's made from eco friendly um, materials like this, the buildings are. Um, there are hiking trails all over. Um, there are um, places to walk around. You can uh, live and work in the area. You can walk to shopping. You can jog on its trails, bike on its trails. Um, you can um, walk downtown for a drink at one of the many establishes, establishments in um, Missoula. I've been to most of them, I might add. And um, you can cook a meal out of locally grown vegetables uh, that you buy in the farmer's market. And, you know, that sounds like a pretty good quality of life here, um, a great quality of life. And, you know, while you're doing all this, you're, you've reduced your carbon footprint to a fraction of what the average American um, produces. And so, and you're doing this without any sacrifice to your quality of life, and you almost never need to, to, to drive so you don't have to get in your, pl uh, your plug-in hybrid car ever, which is great. You can leave that in the garage. And this is exactly the kind of development that we'd like to see happen at places like uh, the Missoula Sawmill site that uh, I think, is that part of the tour that we're seeing later? Is that right? So, you know, just keep this kind of development in mind when you're seeing that place because there is so much potential and it would be a wonderful thing, not only for Missoula, but it would be a great example for the rest of the country and the world. And I'd like to see the, the world really proud of this country again because we set a good example of how to do things right here and this is a great tool to help get us there so i think that's about all i have for now so i hope i didn't depress you too much so thank you Thanks. So we're going to move on to the next section on the agenda, part two, post-lunch, which will hopefully come after a brief walk and wake up. Um, so we're going to move over to the county courthouse. We'll no longer be in this room. The county courthouse is if you leave this building, take a right out of the door, you'll walk across the street, then you'll take a left across the street. So the county courthouse is that way. Farley is going to be walking to room 201. And I'm going to walk to 374. Now, 
Some of you are going to want to get lost on the county courthouse lawn because they are selling cold stone ice cream for $3. And I know that there are sweet tooths among us because they've already told me so. Feel free to do that. You're welcome to do that. When you go inside of the county courthouse, you can ask anyone you see for room 374 or 201. But what you should remember is room 201 is in the new part of the building, not so pretty. 374 is in the old part of the building, beautiful. Little keystones for you. Okay, so we'll see you in a bit. Wander on over. Again, Farley will walk to 370, to, sorry, to 201, and I'm going to walk to 374. Thank you. <laughs> 